you'd say tonight, I'm going to pray for brokenness. You've never been broken because if you've ever been broken, you don't want to pray for it again. But you'll be ever mindful that without it, you're useless as far as eternity is concerned because God uses broken vessels. It's the unlikeliest of journeys, one that opens in an unlikely place under unlikely circumstances. It is the story of a man and a God who takes broken things and shapes them into the unexpected, into a life of impact, of significance. Much of what forms a man is his childhood. The one James was handed delivered adversity, rejection, and insecurity that should have laid the way for a path of self-destruction. Conceived as a product of rape, almost aborted, then born into abject poverty, the first real announcement of James's life on this earth came in the personal section of the newspaper. Wanted, loving Christian couple to raise newborn boy. References required. The Reverend Doyle Hale and his wife Katie answered the ad. They were all that James' mother could have hoped for. While James quickly came to know them as mommy and daddy, his happiness was short-lived. When he was just five, his birth mother, Myra Wattinger, returned to claim him. Torn away from the only parents he had ever known, little James was pulled into a chaotic journey with a mother who was a complete stranger, a journey that began with him hitchhiking 175 miles to the first of many places James would never really call home. The Hales desperately tried to bridge the distance to their beloved little boy with a stream of letters and gifts, but unknown to James, Myra intercepted and returned every one of them, leaving him feeling abandoned and rejected by virtually every adult in his life. By the world's standards, James had little reason for hope. By the world's standards, he should have been aborted. But God had a vastly different plan, and each challenge James faced would help mold and prepare him for the ministry that lay ahead. The next ten years were filled with poverty and the circumstances that often surround it. Hunger, filth, danger, and the kind of isolation that comes from constantly moving. Often the outsider, he was so painfully shy that those who knew him could never have imagined him as the mesmerizing speaker that would later hold millions spellbound, as few in history have. By the age of 15, James had watched his mother struggle through multiple marriages. The final male figure to enter the scene was James' real father, who had 15 years earlier forced himself upon Myra. The hope that his blood father might be the one he had longed for was quickly dashed. Little had changed, and this alcoholic drifter's abuse would pick up right where it had left off. James's life had hung in the balance before. It would again, when one of his father's murderous rages sent James running in self-defense for his 30 6 hunting rifle. As James prepared to pull the trigger, the sheriff arrived to haul his father to jail. That divine intervention was the first of many and the experience prompted a trip back to visit his foster parents. The Reverend and Mrs. Hale had never stopped praying for James, and they would prove instrumental in drawing him into a radical, life-changing encounter. James had returned to the Hales for the summer, the Reverend Hale pastored a small church in Pasadena, Texas, and while it was natural that he would participate in church activities, an added incentive was a sweet, pretty girl who had caught his eye. Betty Freeman's background was the polar opposite of James. She had grown up in a strong Christian family and attended church several times a week. But the two teens had some things in common. Both were shy and insecure. Many in the church were eager for James' salvation, but Mama Hale, ever the prayer warrior, 
was so confident James was going to find Christ at one particular youth service, she brought spare clothes for him to change into after being baptized. I saw James as he sat near the back of the church, clinging to the chair that, he, that was in front of him. And he was not making a move, but he was weeping. I went back to him and took him by his hand. And I said, James, honey, don't you want to come to the Lord today? And he said, yes, ma'am, but I'm so afraid, Mama. And I said, I'll walk down the aisle with you. I stepped down from here and met James as he came. And he looked up into my face and said, Daddy, I trust the Lord as my Savior tonight. And there, as he knelt, there he gave his heart to the Lord. Not long after, James shadowed a young minister over the course of a week-long revival. As it drew to an end, James, to everyone's surprise, moved to the microphone and shared news that would change not only his life, but millions of others to follow. God had called him to be an evangelist. He was an improbable evangelist, a miracle in the making, a fatherless, abused, insecure, shy, and sometimes socially awkward boy who would grow to be one of the most gifted communicators of our time. Betty was the first to see signs of his transformation. He had an insatiable hunger for the Word, and his inherent shyness increasingly gave way to a spiritual boldness. When James left for Bible college, he was alone again, and for a time his timidity returned. Some of the students openly mocked him, but one classmate ventured close enough to witness the zeal of a man on fire. I will never forget that night when James said to me, Billy, I want to tell you something that, and I hope you won't laugh at me, but God has revealed some things to me, and God has called me to be an evangelist, and God has revealed to me that within the next year I will be preaching in some of the largest churches in the nation, and that he, I will have the opportunity to speak in football stadiums, and there will be unbelievable crowds and decisions made for Christ. Billy and James postponed their education and began looking for opportunities to lead revivals. One day, the pair encountered Jimmy Draper, a young preacher in Tyler, Texas, who would later head up the entire Southern Baptist Convention. I first met James, I think it was in 1961. I had just graduated from seminary and was pastor of the Temple Baptist Church out on North Dixie on Gladewater Highway in Tyler. Doorbell rang and it was James Robinson and Billy Foote. James, I think, was 18 years old, and he had just started in the fall semester at East Texas Baptist, but he had decided that he was going to be an evangelist and go into evangelism and was going to drop out of school and wanted to do a revival in our church. Well, of course, you know, I didn't know him or anything, so I, I, I jokingly told him later, I said, I had real wisdom and insight. I told him to forget it and go back to school. James and Billy kept knocking on doors, with Billy faithfully documenting the amazing events that began to unfold. I've got a stack of date books from 1958 all the way through the present day. And I have the date book here that says 1962. And in 1962, James did his first revival meeting to preach. But this was a revival meeting at the Eastview Baptist Church in Kilgore, Texas, and we had a total of 119 decisions in that first revival meeting that James preached. Within two years, James had received more than 1,000 invitations to preach from 27 states and had another life-altering event. Also in this 1963 date book is another very special event. That special event I've got written down here, Wedding, James and Betty, Memorial Baptist Church, Pasadena, Texas, and I had the privilege of being the best man. Winky, my wife, served as the uh, maid of honor. James was a great preacher. He, uh, he had one characteristic, personality characteristic that few evangelist that I have met had. He was a very shy, bashful person. He was only at home when he was in the pulpit. 
It was like they said of Charles G. Finney, the pulpit was his throne. It was spellbounding to hear James Robinson preach. You just sat on the edge of your chair and you hung on every word. He believed in what he said and every fiber of his being went into communicating that. He put it all out there. He preached with his voice, he preached with his body, he preached with his emotion, he preached with his heart, he preached everything. Back in the days of Crusades, we actually did eight-day meetings. We would go into the city, open that crusade, and every day during the day, he would be in two or three schools doing an entire hour or, or longer. He told a lot of funny, well, actually, they were really corny jokes. <laughs> You know, like, hello, all you A students. Hello, all you B students. Hello, all you C students. And hello, friends. <laughs> and then he'd get out of his message, and you could listen to me. You could not keep from watching him and listening to him. Teachers would comment, we've never had our kids pay such respect with the way they listened to him. And those crusades, a majority of the audience would be coming from those high school talks that he did. He honestly cared for the people. He, he wanted the people to meet God. He had been so uh, encountered by the Lord personally that he just couldn't stand the thought of somebody casually believing in God. He wanted them to encounter Jesus the way he did. As the years passed, the venues grew to accommodate the ever-increasing crowds that gathered from coast to coast. Along the way, the intensity of endless travel and ministry to millions led to many moments that teetered between disaster and comedy. We were there one night in the Charlotte Coliseum, and, and on Tuesday night, I vividly remember this. I, I just finished, just finished singing a song, or solo or something, and I walked off the platform, walked behind the platform, and sat down directly behind James with Joe Simmons. Well, he was really preaching that night. He was strolling like that that tiger that he normally was and had his movements going with such power and, and the building was packed. There was eight, eight or 9,000 people around Coliseum and uh, two policemen came out, one on each side of the platform, came with a folding chair and just sat down. And John and I were sitting right directly behind the platform where we could see him. And the policeman came over to me and he said to me, he said, we have had a, uh, a threat on James Robinson's life told him he's going to come down and, and kill James Robinson, and he's going to be in the building. And John McKay just so calmly said, well, let's get up and move our chairs out of the line of fire. <laughs> and we did. And James, after it was over, he came down. He didn't know what happened. He said, why did you guys get up and move for it? Joe told him, he said, you mean tell me you wouldn't take a bullet for me? And old Joe said, no, nah, not me. <laughs> oh, me. And by the way, the end of the story, they found the man drunk and he had the pistol. He, and he was right in front of James about eight rows. The impact of those crusades was so great sometimes that entire cities were changed. Um, it was like that the God moved in and, and people's lives began to change. Teenagers' lives were changed and uh, couples began to reconcile and uh, uh, the churches became stronger, and, and as we would leave a city, those cities then would become a beacon where the Lord was prominent. Billy Graham's daughter Ruth says her father felt a kinship with the young evangelist early on. Daddy always loved to encourage young preachers, but there was something unique about James that he really loved, and I think it was maybe the passion, because he knew that James had the same passion he did, as well as the same gift of evangelism. Billy told me one time, he said, I'm not a great preacher. But he said, I, he said I, I have a gift of extending the invitation. I think James had that gift. It didn't matter what he was preaching on. <laughs> when he gave the invitation, <laughs> hundreds of people were going to come to Christ. Those days, or even now, the altar is going to be full. It's so exciting to know that those crusades were not just big, life-changing events for adults, but they impacted kids, they impacted teenagers. We would sit on the platform and we would look up and we would be praying and praying that those kids would be moved to come on down and make a decision for Christ. And you know, the numbers were astounding. 
In the 21 years that he conducted crusades, James Robison preached to an estimated 20 million people and saw 2 million of them receive Christ through his ministry. There's never been one like James, and there'll never be another. They just won't. God only made one Billy Graham, and he only made one James Robison. The only person I have known that can, can communicate, like James, to even compare him with in, in my lifetime, is Ronald Reagan. He had that same gift. I mean, you had to listen to him. You had to listen to him. I remember the faces of kids that came and stood at the front of those platforms. They stood in such a brokenness and repentance and so much desire. And you know what? We run into those people everywhere we go today. I still encounter people that say, I was a teenager. He came to our school. I came that night. And I accepted Christ. It's a memory in my life. And as long as I'm alive, I'll think about the faces of those that came, the tears, the conviction. To be able to see it, you can't explain it. I can't explain it to you. I couldn't do a lifetime of explanation to make you understand it. But the joy is, in, is indescribable. If I could paint pictures to hang on the walls of, of the whole world, I would paint pictures of those people who left their places in those crusade coliseums and gymnasiums and auditoriums I've watched them as they come trusting Christ. Those pictures pass from instantly, from everlasting death to everlasting life. I won't ever forget that. By 1981, James Robison was a success by any outward definition. He filled stadiums and conference centers from coast to coast. He hosted a national television show, authored several successful books, and had produced two award-winning TV specials. Nearly everyone believed he was the heir apparent to Billy Graham. But inwardly, his private battles with rage and temptation led him to thoughts of suicide. I was in a rage inside. The battle was raging and I was losing. I found myself in the grasp of the enemy. The joy of the Lord was taken away. The peace that passes understanding was gone, and I was filled with torment. One night, I pointed a twin-engine airplane toward the ground very near where Ricky Nelson died, and I tried to take my life in East Texas while headed for a beautiful new home with a wife so lovely and three wonderful children. If he had been flying alone that night, it might have been his last, but James couldn't compel himself to also end the life of the ministry associate traveling with him. Depleted physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, he felt like a living dead man. Even in the early days when James was angry and a lot of times and frustrated, uh, it wasn't hard to love him and to, and to see, I guess all during that time, I could see, see his heart. You know, I would spend hours at night, usually after midnight, on the phone talking about <laughs> the frustrations we, we face and what's normal for men to face and what's not normal and how do you get free and all that kind of stuff. But in the early 80s, Dudley had a life-altering encounter with the Holy Spirit. James was intrigued by the changes he saw in his friend and confidant. I had become involved with uh, several other friends doing what we call conferences on revival. That's some miraculous stuff going on. Well, James came down and uh, just sat in the meeting, uh, one of the meetings where he, he was just like me, just a participant. And uh, the, the Lord healed him of several things. Though he and I talked about being wise <laughs> in how we presented all this, he immediately went to his next crusade and offered for every sick, per sick person there to come forward and he'd pray for him. So that blew the whole thing up. So, so then, <laughs> uh, then we had to deal with our, our buddies who didn't believe that kind of stuff. And uh, so that started several years of uh, what some would call controversy. We just called it a challenge. In 1982, Dudley Hall had introduced James to Milton Green, 
a modest carpet cleaner from Tennessee who was widely respected for his deliverance ministry. Milton Green got a chair, and I really need one. And he put it in the center of a room in the Holiday Inn in Selma, Alabama, and said, would you get in that chair? And he said to me when I sat in that chair, he said, I have delivered hell's angels. I've delivered prostitutes and drug addicts. And I'm sitting here like the big preacher. And he said, and you're the most demonized person I have ever looked at in my life. He said, you are the most tormented man I have ever seen. He said, I cannot imagine how you've been able to minister. Your brain must be on fire. And I said, it is. And I'm dying. And I want to die. And there's like a claw in my brain. And I pray to die. And he said, son, you don't have to. And he laid his hands on my shoulders. And that man began to pray for me. He said, it's all over, son. He said, the party line's going to clear up. The traffic's going to stop, son. You're going to start hearing God again, boy. He said, the Bible's going to come alive to you, son. He said, I'm telling you, boy, it's over. This man didn't live by sight. He knew he had absolute authority over the power of the enemy. Do you know why so few people get free today? Because it takes free people to free people. There was a, a rage, I think, that was even in him fighting against the things he was dealing with, you know, his own personal struggles. Um, and afterwards, that drastically changed. I mean, there was a gentleness, a calmness, um, a desire to um, know God's Word more than I'd ever probably seen in my dad. Oh my gosh, the, the letters, the calls, the, and we're talking about calls from pastors and leaders all over our nation missionaries contacting him going, I want to experience what you experienced. I want this freedom you're describing. When he got free, he, he had such wisdom that he was able to reach kind of both sides of the church world. So James is really called by God to be that bridge builder in the body of Christ. But many pastors and Christian leaders distrusted the ecumenical movement and held James largely responsible. Some withdrew invitations for him to preach or severed treasured friendships. For, for people who didn't live during that time, they cannot fathom what it was like to be in virtually an American theological civil war. I was having trouble at that time understanding how things could be said that were being said. And so I went and asked my own questions of a few of them um, and explained my dad's heart to them the best I knew how at the time because I saw that it was real and that it was, it was God and I had lived with a man at home that I saw that was now different. It's hard for us to understand now how some of these walls divided people in such a way they would never speak to each other, suspect each other, and not even believe that each other was going to heaven, you know, and I'm talking about within the Christian church. But James saw those walls as artificial. He saw that Pentecostals are committed to Jesus, Baptists are committed to Jesus, and the battles of our time are too precious for us to be throwing rocks at each other. It was the greatest personal growth period for me in my life, but also it put strained relationships with those who did not understand that journey. James experienced that a thousand times what I did because his visibility uh, was so enormous. His profile was so strong in America. And that had to be some of the loneliest moments of his life. I'm hearing from God. Do I go with God? If so, do I bring down the wrath of people I love and care for and have believed in me? What do I do? And that, that would have been a profound quandary. There was so much bickering between the leadership, the pastors and the churches that would be coming together to sponsor a crusade. It would just kill James. He would come in and realize that here we are trying to have a meeting to reach a whole city and the leaders can't even come together. And for the last five or six years of my ministry, it's like I've been on a mercy mission to the church. Inviting the church and challenging the church to come to health for the sake of Christ and for the world. And so that 
freedom that he had known and the authority that he began to walk in launched him into another whole emphasis of getting the body of Christ in the Word. Just get in the Word. Because if you get in the Word and you really see truth, you will understand freedom and you will understand loving each other on another level. This desire for unity was first carried out through In the Word seminars and then later seen at Bible conferences where guest speakers covered a wide range of theological opinion. Pastor Jack Hayford was one of many national figures invited by James. I was, of course, very, very aware of uh, James' ministry, the national ministry, and uh, had respect for him. But uh, there was a remarkable occasion of a guy asking a Pentecostal pastor to come and speak to a group of Baptists, for the most part Baptists, about speaking in tongues. And he said, I'm not interested in selling people on tongues. I just think they need to get over the uh, supposition that there's something evil rather than biblical and that uh, there is a, a sane way of dealing with the subject. He was one of the first ones to identify that it was time to bring a truce and an end to the war between Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals. He was one of the early ones that was able to cross that line. And once he began to cross those lines, having been such a firebrand and so controversial, uh, and once he sort of withstood the criticism he got for it, uh, he began to tear down those walls. And look where we are now. Now we've got inter an interdenominational movement that's more prominent than almost any denomination. And, and uh, people work together in the pro-life cause, work together to take care of the poor. Uh, I'm not saying it never happened before James, but he certainly made it a cause. And he made it part of following Jesus. He would say, if you're going to follow Jesus, you got to love Catholics, you got to love Baptists, you got to love Methodists. He was severely, roundly criticized by many on both sides for a stretch, but time has proven him to be right, and most of those critics were long ago silenced, and many of those critics embraced him. But he pounded the drum the hardest, the longest, on that issue, and uh, to make sure we all began to walk in the way that Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer, that we may be one. A contentious U.S. presidential election was two months away. The challenger, Ronald Reagan, was a former movie star with deep roots in Hollywood. The incumbent, Jimmy Carter, was a dedicated Baptist who had been a Sunday school teacher. Evangelical voters had gone heavily for Carter in 1976, but in August of 1980, James Robison organized a gathering of 17,000 Christians and many prominent evangelicals. The meeting showcased Ronald Reagan and received massive press coverage. You know, our country was, was going downhill quickly. And James got such a burden for it in 1979. And he called that meeting the National Affairs Briefing, and I was at that meeting. And it was amazing to see what happened in our country after that. And it was amazing to see Christians stand up and be counted. It's important for us to know that the distrust that was turned towards Ronald Reagan. It's hard to imagine now because he's such a hero to us. But at that time, again, a man divorced, a man from Hollywood, a man from California, a man who had not sounded faith themes like others had. So uh, people weren't really on the religious side of American politics. They weren't really interested in endorsing him. The, the religious right or, or religiously oriented conservatives trusted James because he'd already paid his dues. He was a warrior with some scars uh, in, in the cause and they trusted him. So when he said, look, I've looked into Reagan's eyes, I've met with him, I know who he is, uh, we've talked and I think he's God's man, they listened. I uh, suggested to Mr. Reagan that, that because it was a bipartisan that it would be in his best interest since we could not and would not endorse him as a body, that it would probably be wise if his opening comment would be, I know this is nonpartisan, non so you gathering. can't endorse me. And so I know that you can't endorse me. But I want you to know I endorse but you. I only brought that up because I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. Well, that headlined everywhere. I, you can't endorse me, I endorse you. Well, you can imagine what that did for, for caring traditional value people. When James stood up to speak, the anointing of God laid on that man. And I'm telling you, that audience would have jumped off the cliff if he said, let's go do it right now. 
He captivated it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, it was powerful. Don't you commit yourself to some political party or politician. You commit yourself to the principles of God and demand those parties and politicians align themselves with the eternal values in this book. And America will be forever the greatest nation on this earth. Uh, he was able to sort of introduce Reagan to the religious right and get them comfortable with him. And, and that had a profound impact on the course of that election. We go to Washington, where he has big news and press conferences, and he started talking, and I watched those people respond. Their, their jaws were dropping. They didn't, you know, normally they'll interrupt you, they'll come back with questions and everything, and James had their full attention. They were spellbound. I have heard senators and congressmen in a room, when I was on one side and he's on the other, going, that's James Robinson, that's James Robinson. Preach the town, yeah, 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 I wanna to talk to him. Reagan would call him, they would speak from time to time, there were the White House, House visits, and the White House visits get you know, all the attention of the cameras, but that's not the real issue. It's who you pick up the phone to call when you gotta make a decision that's tough. And, and Ronald Reagan would, upon occasion, call James Robinson. The fact that he's not afraid to take a lead is a way of serving. Because you get in, the, you get in a room sometimes with, with guys and there's an intimidation factor, or you got so many leaders in there that there is a, a combatant deal. Uh, James just assumes that if he's in there, uh, he's there to lead. You, know, you have to remember that George W. Bush was also distrusted by the religious right or evangelicals in politics, Christians in politics, just like Reagan was. But James had heard that there had been a change in George W.'s life, and so he went to see him. And uh, it's one of the most critical conversations, I think, uh, in American history, uh, certainly the 20th century. Um, George W. Bush said, look, I, I, I had a problem with drinking, uh, but that's over now. Uh, I've given my life to Jesus. Well, James was stunned. But then he said, I, I think I'm supposed to run for president. God wants me to do it. And he said, I think my country is going to go through something horrible. And, and my country is going to need me at that time. Now he's talking to James. Only James hears this. James asked, would you be willing to meet with small groups of religious leaders in this country? Would you be willing to let me sort of bridge for you and introduce you a bit? And Bush said yes. I believe that God has used him over the years and is using him now uh, as a prophet to try and call the nation back to God and in specific to call churches back to God. If there's no James Robinson or if James Robinson doesn't have the courage that he actually had, uh, you don't have Ronald Reagan uh, getting connected to the religious right. You might have him as president maybe down the road, not in the election in which he was first elected, I don't think. You don't have George W. Bush uh, understood by religiously active people uh, in politics. His voice in the political issues of our culture, which really have to do with the, the spiritual implications of those issues, it's not a matter of going political, it's a matter of recognizing that we are people who live in a republic and believers have the right to, of a voice. We've been given a voice and so we have the right to exercise it. In March 2012, James Robison and co-author Jay Richards released their book entitled Indivisible, Restoring Faith, Family and Freedom Before It's Too Late. The book debuted at number five on the New York Times bestseller list. One of the greatest contributions he will be known for is his book, Indivisible. Uh, I wish we could get in the, hand, that in the hands of every single American and they would read it. It would turn our nation around. It may be one of the most significant things he's ever, ever written. He really does love his country and he loves the people in it and he wants the truth to be disseminated. And I, I appreciate that he speaks the truth, but it's not bombastic. It's not hard. He has the ability to call together Christian leaders that maybe nobody else does, maybe my, my father used to, but he has a, the ability to do that and they respect him, they listen to him. I've watched him move with comfort among the powerful, the elite. He doesn't seem to have any levels of intimidation at all. He 
goes with the same holy boldness he would go with someone who has nothing. He's able to gather those of us who probably wouldn't otherwise necessarily be in the same room, not we're opposed to each other, it's just that he's the trust contact that when he gets on the phone and calls you, people come. He does it with a gentleness. He's not afraid to speak the truth. He will not back down from truth. And that's, that's unique. To start writing the history of American politics in the last, let's say, 40, 50 years, without James Robinson in it is to, I mean, God's still sovereign and things would still get done, but you wouldn't have uh, what, what we had. You wouldn't have the coalitions. You wouldn't have the definition of those coalitions. You'd have a political uh, coalition, but it wouldn't have the orientation on the poor. You'd have a, a religious coalition, but it, maybe it wouldn't feel bold about speaking about unity or race. Uh, maybe those are considered liberal issues. James said they're not liberal issues, they're Jesus issues. Ronald Reagan, Billy Graham, Tom Landry, Robert Duvall. James Robison has counted all of them among his friends. Some have been guests at his home. Others will remain forever anonymous. A long line of shell-shocked, scandalized, or emotionally broken celebrities and Christian leaders who found the Robisons' home a place of acceptance and healing. When I came with James, one of the things that I noticed is that he not only ministered to those people, but many times he would even bring them into his home, love them, nurture them, pray with them, and bring them back into fellowship with Christ. James is one of the least judgmental persons I've ever met. There's a very real sense that when someone implodes, spiritually implodes, when someone is self-destructive, he sees beyond that calamity and he actually sees what the person can be restored to. I remember the first time that um, there was a pastor that was very national pastor news that had fallen. And in that first Bible conference after that, uh, James had him come up on stage and said, um, you know, we're gonna love you and we're gonna help you. And one of the speakers who was backstage about to speak, a very well-known speaker actually left. And he said, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna speak if you're gonna have that person on the stage. And so James has counted the call since the beginning but he's never left the fallen. Oh, it's been a couple of years ago after I wrote In Every Pew Sits a Broken Heart. And I hadn't seen James and Betty for a long time. Um, they went one direction, I sort of went the other. But, um, and I was a little nervous. You know, what were they gonna say? What were they gonna do? Was they gonna stand in judgment and, you know, well, Ruth, you know, get your act together. When are you gonna, but there was no, it was a full embrace and just warm, loving gentleness that ministered and healed me. I won't forget the first time James hugged me. It was like something, it was like God hugged me. I mean, it was like uh, him embracing me. It was something I'd really never felt before. And uh, it was just a pretty special feeling. Just him continually feeding into me uh, encouragement, love. Um, you know, it is important. I mean, especially the line of work that I'm in, you know, where you got people pulling at you and, and you know, dragging you down and, uh, you know, just saying things that you know a lot of times aren't true, which James deals with the same stuff. He has mentored many, many people. But, but I would say uh, that uh, uh, maybe above them all, uh, the role that he plays so well is a, is a role of a friend. If, uh, if James is your friend, he's your friend for life. And those who've had the uh, privilege of having him stand with them he won't back off when things get tough. And there are lots of prophets and there are lots of evangelists, but truthfully, there are not many friends. Proverbs says there is a friend that's closer than a brother. And that's the way James is. He never looked down on me. He never looked down on my weaknesses. Even when I was going through the, the worst time of my life, when I'd blown it, he is the type of friend you can go to uh, and tell him your worst secret, and he's going to love you. In 1988, James' legendary compassion was challenged on a global scale. That year, he encountered Peter Pretorius in South Africa. 
Peter had abandoned his wealthy lifestyle after becoming stranded in a remote African village where he spent 10 days burying men, women, and children as they died of thirst and hunger. Peter was, had given everything he had. He was broke. And I think he was feeding about 5,000 kids a month. And, and so when James met him, we all knew something was about to happen. We went into Mozambique and went right up to Tet and started to see real poverty. I mean, Mozambique at that time, 400,000 people died in the first three months of 1984. So things were terrible. I mean, no matter where you went, people were in the process of starving and malnutrition was really so bad amongst the children. So, I mean, it was a, a first sort of explosive exposure for James. I mean, I literally watched James's thoughts, you know, uh, his whole approach, uh, his life, in fact, being um, challenged and in a sense provoked. And I mean, he told me later, he said, Peter, this has been the biggest life-changing experience for me. I can remember him almost being a little dysfunctional because of the emotional impact that it had over him for a while. The path was shown to him very clearly that this ministry was to support those missionaries over in Africa and many other parts of the world. If someone's stomach is growling so, and I am trying to give them a Bible lesson, but they have not had a bite in their stomach for 48 hours, how can they hear? But if I go in, as Betty and James do, and try to meet a physical need, an area of absolute desperation, show them, demonstrate the gospel, before I speak the gospel, if I will go out and live the gospel, then I'm gonna speak the gospel. That is their approach. That is what causes people to listen. When we first started coming to Africa, first my first trip, we stayed in huts. We stayed in these little, you can see them around here, little thatched huts. It'd be like 90 to 100 degrees at night and so hot, but I never once heard them complain. They're so real. They're just people and in, in, in they're in there because their heart is for the poor and for the needy. It's around the world. It's a global thing that we do now. And then our outreach is even stretched beyond feeding and water. And now we reach We're rescuing. We're rescuing children that are being kidnapped and trafficked in sex and slave trade. God has called this ministry to be a trusted place for everybody that says, I want to do something, but I can't do it by myself. I want to join someone to get this done more effectively. And that's what Life Outreach has become. It's not only a, a wonderful blessing for the people he's advocating for, but it's a gift to the body of Christ because it continues to say to every preacher, pastor, prophet, leader out there, if you, if you don't care for these, you know, you really don't, you don't care for the ones that God's heart is for. His and Betty's heart for the, for the African children and, and the starving people over there has been beyond comparison, really. I mean, somehow or another, uh, God just directed him to that part of the world and and he never looked back. 25 years after James Robison first witnessed the human catastrophe in Mozambique, Life Outreach International has sent supplies, money, and ministry teams to crisis situations in 50 different nations across six continents. More than two decades of continuous mission feeding in Africa has helped save the lives of an estimated seven million children. And millions more throughout 40 countries are now able to drink clean water from one of the 3,400 freshwater wells Life Outreach has drilled, or soon from the 500 additional ones planned for this year. I mean, I know that when James came out to Africa, he went back from Africa to America and sold some of the assets within the ministry so that he could start the work in Africa. That's the impact he sensed and what would happen. And, and, and I mean, look where we are now. We have saved the lives of millions of children. 
And today we are feeding over 500,000 children every day. I think that's remarkable. More than 10 million people have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through the gospel outreaches that we've done all over Africa. Without a doubt, James and Betty Robinson, I think have just touched everybody from the young to the old, from the rich to the poor, the educated to the uneducated. There's a scripture in the Bible that I really believe that describes their life. It is found in Jude 22. It reads this way, and some having compassion, making a difference. He's a man with a deep heart of compassion. In fact, that may, in addition to what he's done in politics and of course leading souls to Jesus, that may be one of his great legacies, uh, is that he helped the church come back to its social responsibility um, rooted in, in the compassion of Jesus. James, probably more than any other person, has such a heart for the least of these. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, a housewife who feels neglected here in America or um, a child halfway across the world that doesn't have clean water. His legacy is that Jesus is going to say to him one day, well done, good and faithful servant, because what you did to the least of these, you did to me. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. By 1968, fiery 25-year-old crusade evangelist James Robison was already being compared to Billy Graham. Ironically, it was Dr. Graham himself who encouraged James to consider television. Billy was so kind and gracious to begin to speak into James's life and ministry. You're, you're so effective, but we need somebody with your kind of gifting and your communication skills on television. In 1971, James began hosting a half-hour program, inviting viewers to get together with James Robison. Singers John McKay, Jeannie Rogers, and James' daughter Rhonda were show regulars, with other musical guests joining in from week to week. In addition to his regular show, James was also hosting and producing primetime specials. Two of them, Attack on the Family and Wake Up America, prompted more than 400,000 calls and letters from viewers seeking spiritual help and received prestigious awards from the national religious broadcasters. The idea of what could be done through a daily television program was just not out there. He saw things I guess the rest of us didn't see because uh, we, we regretted losing the kind of evangelists that we felt like could really make an impact on the country. Uh, and yet, uh, doubtless, more people have responded to him uh, through the television than would have in, in Crusades. Well, the genius of the transition for him was his capacity to focus on one person. If James Robinson was speaking to 10,000 people, he was speaking to one. And when he went to a camera, if he was speaking, if there's millions listening, he was speaking to one. He fixates, he focuses on the individual, their need, and their potential if they could but know the depth of the love of God for them. So it was, for James, I would contend, a very easy transition. Through the years, James' television presence continually evolved with his priorities and the calling on his life. In 1995, his Life Today program transitioned to a contemporary talk show format with a studio audience. I've uh, enjoyed watching James learn to be an interviewer. We laughed a lot in the early days because he would ask somebody a question, then he would answer. And uh, the, the inter <laughs> interviewee would just sit there and go, okay, I, that's what I would have said if you'd let me say it. Uh, he's been a student and he's learned how to uh, be a better interviewer. And uh, he was always effective in front of the camera because he has no problem looking a person in the eye, whether it be the President of the United States or an audience that's out there, and he was created by God to, to speak into a camera. Through the years, Life Today has steadily expanded its audience and its mission. The half-hour program airs in more than 300 million homes across North America, is syndicated in Europe and Australia, and is carried worldwide by two major Christian networks. Every show features a humanitarian outreach that viewers are encouraged to support as well as compelling interviews with people from all walks of life, sharing stories that teach, inspire, motivate, 
and often move viewers of the program. Well, of course, I love life today. I know when I've been on, it's very unique that James will have us for dinner ahead of time, and then he'll say, okay, what do you want to talk about? And if I ask this question, you just run with it. You just talk about what you want to talk about. Not many hosts do that. He is so open and so willing to share his platform with other people. That was one of the things in, in, in my early time when I came to work with James, is his ability to discern people and then go right into their heart and their soul and bring things out. Man, he can talk to anybody. I mean, because it seems like no matter what you're going through, he's, he's been through it some degree or another. You know, and, and that ability to, to empathize with people and f actually feel their suffering has given him an ability to minister to them. That ability increased exponentially with the addition of James' feminine side, Betty. James said, I really want Betty to come and join me on the set. And I was thrilled behind the scenes. I was, I know TV people are going, she's so shy, she won't have anything to say. But I knew another side of this woman. Betty's intriguing to watch. I like to watch the interaction between them. She's quiet, but when she speaks, uh, the well runs deep, very deep. It's always significant. I don't think James would be the person he is without Betty at all. Uh, she has a strength. She's like a steel magnolia. She's a very soft-spoken, but she speaks her mind. And he, he leans on her for wisdom, advice, from, uh, for Christian counsel, uh, for her biblical knowledge. To, to me, one of the most interesting and exciting things is to watch Betty blossom. She's a total opposite from James. It was a very good thing to add Betty to it. Many people don't know this about her, but her sense of humor is, is quick. James, is, over the years, has gotten a little bit heavier. He's still pretty fit. But um, he told Betty one time, he said, Betty, I think I, I would lose the weight and I would get really trim, but I'm just so afraid it's going to make women stumble. And Betty said, go ahead and risk it. <laughs> Popular speaker, author, and Bible teacher Beth Moore visited Life Today as a guest in 2006, James and Betty felt her teaching was so powerful that they gave her one day of their program all to herself. It's called Wednesdays with Beth. They believe in what God is doing in other people. They don't think they're the only thing going in the Christian universe on planet Earth at this time. And it's part of what makes it work is that everybody on there is a piece of what Christ is doing, a piece of the puzzle on the global um, uh, front of the gospel and it is a beautiful thing. When certain people or um, ministries, if they've had an impact, brought life to his heart, um, he's seen good things in it, then he wants to share it. James has shared one of his greatest passions, helping the helpless with Life Today viewers for 25 years. When James went on his first mission trip, and came back and started showing it on the air and, and saying, we want to help these people. I don't know of any person at that time that was doing it. Uh, it seemed like uh, every television ministry was help us, help you. But James's uh, ministry immediately became help us, help them. Many people said, you brought missions into our living room too. You brought needy people into our living room. And we couldn't forget those faces, and we couldn't forget their stories. We had to be a part of that. Over the years, several Life Today guests have participated in a televised trip to one of Life's many foreign missions. All who have journeyed overseas agree that the experience is life-changing. I was blown away by what I saw in Angola with what they were doing. And they do it around the world, and I, I'm just, um, they have a heart for it. It's, it's part of their passion for the gospel. It truly is because they can preach all day long. But unless you really care about the people, and this is what I said about James, he cares, he has a heart for people. When he starts talking about what is moving them right now to help people, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and it's, I don't say this gratuitously or insincerely, I'll tear up because the compassion that you feel for what he describes is not a matter of saying, I feel bad because James does. You feel bad because he's really identified something that is worthy of that dimension of compassion and care. 
One of the things I love about James is that he is serious about this issue of water and digging wells. So when you're on the program, he loves you. He's read your book or he knows who you are. He's built relationship with you. You get on that show, though, he's not enamored of you. We're going to talk to you. We're going to talk to you for a certain amount of time. Now we're going to talk about wells. I've watched him on television as he has literally raised millions of dollars to feed and clothe and provide water and help for the people, the hurting people, third world people, the people that are forgotten. But when he stopped traveling and doing crusades and he sat down and he began to speak to the whole world, that's when the greater works came. Instead of, you know, uh, 7,000 people saved in a year or so, it was 7 million. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. He completely multiplied himself when he obeyed God to sit down and to say what God was telling him to say. The ministry is so much more today than it, than it used to be. It did used to be a man with a message. And, and today it's, it's more of a ministry with a mission. Out of all the things I think I respect most uh, is that even though they've had this very long obedience in the same direction for all of these years, they have been determined, both James and Betty, to keep growing, and I love it. I think it's why the program still works. I think it's why it never gets old. They never get old. They just keep getting in there with Jesus and letting Him do a fresh thing, and it shows all over them. I love that. I've been sitting in the room when James was asked why he did a certain radical thing. And, uh, and those in the room expected either he did it to gain attention or to grow his ministry or somehow just draw, you know, just draw the media's attention. And he would very simply say, well, I, I prayed and the Lord told me to do it. And the room gets real quiet because it's almost like we've forgotten that people can function that way. God just continually puts a different hat on James and he says, okay, and he steps out and he just goes for it with such courage and such trust that God will supply everything that is needed for him to wear that hat. He is a, a weeping prophet. He's a Jeremiah. Uh, he, he's a Nehemiah. He sees that the walls have been torn down and they need to be rebuilt. Truth is not always popular, but James was always willing to speak forth the truth but he always did it in love. I've seen him bring people together across racial, class, and cultural lines to be on the same page as, in spite of their differences politically or socially. The James I knew dearly loved Jesus Christ. He loved young people. He'd spent, he'd spent half a night with them just winning them to Christ. You cannot manufacture passion for souls. He has it. The, the thing that motivated him, you could tell it if you were close, was he cared about those people sitting out there. He, he didn't want them going to hell. He didn't want them struggling. He didn't want them living in sin. He didn't want them living less than they should be. As good a preacher as he would, he could have been the proudest preacher that ever lived, but he wasn't. He wasn't. James had a humble heart. He got out, came over, knelt on the ground in front of me, and said, is everything settled? I said, no, it's not. And he just looked at me, he said, it's a gift. Salvation is a gift. You can't do anything to earn it. And uh, he prayed with me, and that changed everything in my life. From that point on. I've watched, I've watched men and women come up to him, pastors that have come up to him that say that I, I used to, you know, I came to a crusade when you were, when I was 10 years old and there they are, they're, they're 45 years old leading a church of, you know, 1,200 or 1,500 people. I think about what a father figure he represents and isn't that the irony since really that was not what he had. You know, without the partnership with Life Outreach International, I think many, many hundreds of thousands, even millions of children would have lost their lives. I would believe that, that he wants his legacy to be Jesus, that that's who people remember when they think of James Robinson. Only heaven will reveal 
all the good of James Robson and Beta Robson. I really believe God has assured me that he is going to use James Robinson and Betty Robinson until the end. And we'll go to our graves doing what we're supposed to do, what God called us to do. And we're gonna go with a greater anointing in these next days. But I'm telling you, what I see the Holy Spirit saying, we haven't seen anything yet. It's gonna be so good.